Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Simonetta Moro and I'm the director of the Institute for Doctoral Studies in the Visual Arts or IDSVA. It is a great pleasure to host this third and final spring lecture, which is part of a year long symposium on the topic of the Anthropocene. We have invited distinguished artists and scholars worldwide to discuss the role of art and philosophy in relation to questions of ecology, climate change, coexistence, and sustainability as an existential urgency of our times. Today, we have the honor to host Dr. Giovanni Battista Tuza, who will talk about revolution, Anthropocene, geoesthetics of the planetary condition. This webinar will last um, one hour. If there is time left, I will take a couple of questions from the audience in the last 10 to 15 minutes. So please uh, write your questions in the dedicated Q&A box uh, that you will find uh, at the bottom of your screen. And um, if you have other communications or links to share, you may also use the chat box for that. Thank you. Uh, before properly introducing Giovanni Battista Tuza, let me say a few words about IDSVA for those of you who are new to the program. IDSVA is a low residency PhD program in visual arts, philosophy, aesthetics, and art theory. It was founded in 2007 by Professor George Smith, who is the president of IDSVA, with the idea to provide a new kind of education to artists and creative thinkers at the intersection of art and philosophy. Although we are based in Portland, Maine, as a true nomadic institution, IDSVA has no brick and mortar campus, but combines long distance courses and in-person intensive residences. These residences take our students in many different places around the world to learn how ideas, artistic production, and places are interconnected. We believe that in our current time, it is even more urgent to consider these interconnections and put the question of ecology front and center. IDSVA's aim is to change the way we think, to change the way we see the life world and the way we see one another. That change, the change we're working toward as a shared communal aspiration, stands at IDSVA vision of the possible. And I would now like to invite one of our PhD candidates, uh, Rachel M. Rolson, to introduce our guest speaker today, Giovanni Battista Tuza. Thank you. Thank you, Samanada. It is my very great honor to introduce Giovanni Tusa, a philosopher and video artist currently based at the Institute of Philosophy at the Nova Institute University of Lisbon, Portugal, and visiting faculty at the Institute for Doctoral Studies in the Visual Arts. His multidisciplinary research focuses on philosophy, radical politics, cinema, ecology, contemporary arts, media theory, and animal studies. His latest work, The End, co-authored with Alain Badu, was published in France in 2017, now translated with new original essays in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. He is currently working on the manuscript of his book, Minima Planetaria, and is the director of Planetary Conversations for the Philosophical Salon. His forthcoming project is Visual Diary, an essay film on the death of Greek philosopher Empedocles in Amazonia. He will be speaking today on the lecture entitled Revolution Anthropocene, Geoesthetics of the Planetary Condition. Welcome, Professor Tusa. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I hope you can hear me fine, all of you. Um, yeah, I also start thanking uh, people actually who invited me here. First of all, of course, Simonetta. Um, she was, of course, the one who asked me to, to come for this third, I think, and last session of this spring semester or spring seminar. And then I would like also to thank George Smith, um, Simonetta uh, already recalled him as the president of IDSVA, who in the last year has been more than friendly, uh, more than friendly presence in my life. So I'll um, I'll start now. Um, uh, this is a very strange format for me, so I hope I don't make big mistakes, and um, I'll try to introduce. Um, my topic for today, as you already heard, the, the title of my talk is Revolution Anthropocene, uh, Geostatics of the Planetary Condition. <clears throat> um, to be clear, um, the term Anthropocene is a very um, complicated one in the sense that it became so uh, abused, more than used, that uh, 
it's becoming increasingly complicated to use this term without making some distinction or at least taking some position whenever you are using it. Um, as you may be aware, many scholars, artists, philosophers, um, biologists, um, geologists, of course, um, pointed out how uh, calling this age Anthropocene is taking into consideration that only Anthropos, which as you may know, is the Greek word for human, and a very special kind of Anthropos is defining our age. So for this reason, as you may know, uh, many definitions of this age have been uh, proposed uh, from um, capital, Capitolocene to Plantocene. Um, then there are, many, there are many variations about Anthropocene, like Anthropos, Anthropos obscene or Anthropos not seen, and so, and so on and so on. I will just say something that, of course, using with this word without um, critically engage with the word itself would be just um, following the steps of or just continuing to uh, this uh, very, very strange plot or very criminal plot of um, the Anthropos as the only hero or rather the lane of the, of the adventure of colonization and what we call civilization. But this said, um, I'm still keeping for this seminar uh, the word Anthropocene and the term, as I think this term also exhibits some interesting uh, potentialities and its use is not uh, yet exhausted. Uh, by, his, by its abuse. I'll try now to say why. Okay. So what we define, what the definition Anthropocene um, defines or describes. As you may know, the word Anthropocene is made up from two terms. One is, as I said before, Anthropos. The other one is seen or from a Greek kainos. So anthropos means human and kainos means recent or new. So through the term anthropocene, um, at the beginning, geologists try to describe the end of an age called geological epoch called Holocene and the beginning of a new geological age, which is defined uh, by the intervention of Anthropos, by the human, which in this, um, in this view becomes one of the, uh, let's say, geomorphic agent, which means not only is, of course, influential, not only influence what happens on the earth, but is also an agent, is also able to change geologically the very composition of the earth of the planet itself. Okay, we must say that this definition has not been upset by geology, at least by the official geological definition, which have always rejected uh, Anthropocene as the term to define the current geological age, but yet Anthropocene has been maintained as a kind of hypothesis in social science, in the arts, also in, in, in natural science, um, to define an age in which the acceleration of certain human activities radically changed the face of the earth. So I'm not um, here to enter into this debate of if it's true or not that geologically speaking, Anthropocene is a new age. But what I keep from this is that anyway, the Anthropocene defines a new temporality for the human as being situated in geologic time. And at the same time, the Anthropocene falls geologic time into human corporeality, refocusing, refocusing attention on the temporality of human forces within the subject. 
So for me, it's not so important to define is the earth itself, at least in this seminar, of course, is changed by humans as geomorphic agents. But what is interesting for me now is to see how humans or what we have been calling anthropos, which means a very special kind of human being, which in a sense pretended to, became, to become a universal human being, is being changed by or within this age. Um, what is very important for me here is that, as I said before, the Anthropocene is axiomatic of the new understandings of time, matter, and agency for the humans as a collective being and as a subject capable of geomorphic acts. So what is fundamental to, to understand here is that the concept of the Anthropocene also points to a paradox. The more powerful and real the collective impact of the species is, the less contemporary individuals feel capable of influencing their surrounding reality. Um, so it seems that Anthropocene, as we have been uh, defining it, uh, just means that actually human beings are more powerful than ever before. But on the other side, we see how this Anthropocene exhibit exactly the failure of any kind of anthropocentric thought as it shows the co-activity or the cooperation or the coalition, let's say, of humanity with non-human beings and how this um, co-activity, cooperation, co coexistence is constitutional for understanding what human beings are. So if we could see, it could seem, could seem that Anthropocene uh, is the name for the age of the fulfillment of this kind of a universal and abstract, abstract human being that became the subject of whole world history, actually it also reveals the end of this um, separated history of human beings and opens up uh, human beings or, or humanity uh, to this constitutive ecological uh, co-activity with other than human beings. Okay, so um, why, um, why is so important to take distance in a sense from this um, a critical use of Anthropocene. Um, because geology has never been a neutral science. Um, I think you might be familiar with this book, uh, which was written by Catherine Yusof, A Black Billion Anthropocenes or No One. In this book, uh, Yusof um, points out how geology is not just um, a, classic, a classificatory science or a neutral science, but we know that no science is neutral, of course, but it has been a very special companion for uh, the colonial adventure and the division of human beings into human and inhuman, as geology has been the science for classifying um, beings into extractable or non-extractable resources. In this sense, geology has been, uh, once again, um, constitutive into this um, adventure we call here modernity. And in a sense has been one of the elements which have been an element of discrimination uh, for deciding um, who is human, uh, and who or what is not human. Um, what we call modernity has been defined by uh, a project. 
First of all, uh, here I'm, I'm saying modernity as if modernity is one. We'll see later that actually, if we don't exit this temporality in which modernity is one, and now it seems to have reached its end, we won't escape, of course, this narrative of this plot of the Anthropocene as the fulfillment of a human action on the world. So, um, in her book, Vita Activa, the, uh, the Modern Condition of Human Life, Anna Arendt um, analyzed when and how modernity actually started. He never, in her map of modernity, Arendt um, argues that modernity starts when um, certain strata of population, and the term strata as in geological science is not by chance, as you might understand already, is deprived of its capacity of, of connecting to the world. Um, Arendt calls this deprivation of the world with a Greek term, which is akosmia, which means, as you might know, uh, the loss of the cosmos. By cosmos meaning um, the sense through which we organize our world and we understand our connection with the world. So, this systematic deprivation of certain strata of population of their own world, this kind of destruction of the world for certain strata of population, is for an Arendt the starting point of this project of, of humanity as separated from the world itself. This very specific project created something that we might see also today, which is on one side, you have a kind of demurgic plastic humanity. And on the other side, you have the world or more specifically the earth as an object of um, property or devastation. Achille Bembe, a, a very important philosopher from Cameroon, um, wrote in a, in a very recent book, I think he's not yet translated in, in English, but I might be wrong. He used an architectural term to define this condition. Um, he used this term, which is brutalism, uh, to describe, I, I, I quote from him, an age caught in the pathos of demolition and production on a planetary scale of reserves of darkness and waste of all kinds, traces of a gigantic demiurgy, end of the quote. Uh, I'm, I'm translating from French, so it might be not, not exactly what he's saying. I hope this is what he's saying also in English. So this gigantic project of demolition of an planetary scale through the production of a separate artificial humanity has been for Arendt, and I say here also for Achille Bembe, the fundamental project of what we call modernity or our modernity. At the end of this, of this narrative, uh, we see how nowadays the, the waste of this project, let's say, the, what is left by this project is, as Bembe says, waste of all kinds. This waste not, not, not only uh, is present in, in, on the earth and in the ocean and so on and so on, but of course also on or in the atmosphere, in the air, uh, which is what I, I will present later in my, in my talk today. Anyway, what is important is that this modernity reduced all possible imaginary all of what we are or what our world is to this project of production and consequently of this uh, project of, of production of waste on a planetary scale uh, in which also the anthropogenic climate change, it is 
the only possible, uh, let's say, outcome or production of, of, of this, of, of this uh, imaginary. Um, this imaginary, as we said before, is uh, characterized by this kind of geological description, which has been called by some scholars, and not only scholars, artists, activists, and so on, um, with the term extractivist. No? Extractivism um, describe this approach to the earth, to any being actually, which is basically uh, this understanding of matter as something from which you extract a certain amount of energy. So it seems that the, mod the modern project also uh, brings within itself um, this approach to energy, which is uh, I um, destroy something, I reduce it to its atomic non-divisible state, I break this state and I extract the maximum amount of energy. Um, so in, in a sense, with this word, you know, extraction, what comes to our mind immediately is, of course, oil drilling, uh, coal or mineral mining. But nowadays, um, and of course, all these activities were um, defined by Andras Malb with the term which was fossil uh, capitalism. So a capitalist based on the extraction of, of fossil um, resources. But increasingly, this extraction also include a digital appropriation relating to social media, surveillance-based data mining, IT processing, algorithm capture, which expand, of course, uh, the zone, extractive zone to the techno infospheres, the growing information industry. You might think, of course, of Amazon, Google, Facebook, Alibaba, and so on, so on, that collects and commodifies big data, relies on the enormous cybernetic accumulation of preferences, identities, consumer habits, political tendencies, social network, and so on, and so on, of course. All these kind of images that mobilize, <clears throat> that are mobilized by security, security, medical, marketing, publicity, and consumer industries. So this is to say that extractivism here not only could be referred to the pure uh, extraction of fossil uh, materials or energies, but it also extend nowadays. Uh, to other activities which, of course, uh, comprise uh, the cybernetic, cybernetic organization of society. Uh, a friend of IDSVA, Franco Berdo Bifo, uh, uh, Bifo spoke of exploitation of the soul as the new ground um, of this, of this uh, activity of extraction, of disseminated extractivism that define our age. Anyway, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm what I'm keeping here from the from from the Anthropocene uh, hypothesis is that anyway, with all the ambiguity that this term uh, brings within it, what was considered separate, as we have seen, this the music humanity and the earth as an object of depredation and demolition now appears to be connected in a common temporal destiny, or at least in a kind of inevitable collision. And what is important here is that through the Anthropocene hypothesis, what appears now to be clear that somehow the humanity, the humani let's say humanity, not only as a species, but also as a as I said before, as a narrative, as a plot, uh, cannot be reduced to bi the biological dimension because as we've seen, the geological, the rather than human, the more than human, the less than human, also are agent of this history. Until now, we spoke of a single history. We use humanity as if 
it ever existed one humanity. So now maybe is the time to, and we also spoke of the earth as if one earth ever existed. So maybe now it's time to open up a bit our, um, um, uh, the understanding of all this. Um, so, um, last year, uh, sorry, I know that this is recorded and I'm supposed to be uh, very instructional and this is a webinar, so on, so on, and so on. But I can't, of course, when you talk even to people you don't know, you try to engage in a dialogue, even if you're alone in front of a screen. So, um, I, I'm also kind of interacting with an imaginary audience there. So last year I wrote an article which was called um, The Limitation uh, of Other Earths, in which I was claiming actually that on one side, after the bombings in 1945 of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, a new continent emerge earth as a new sacred planet which suddenly were, was recognized as untouchable as let's say our common uh, heritage that all of us has to repair on the other side um, the earth became more and more uh, object of this demolition and depredation I was talking about before, because we assisted to what has been called by scholars, by philosophers, by sociologists, by what has been called the great acceleration, which means since the 60s, the increase of emission of, uh, of CO2 uh, became exponentially, um, has been growing exponentially. So we have uh, this paradoxical state in which on one side this new sacred planet emerged after the disaster of Hiroshima and Nagasaki so for the first time humanity felt as one in front of this catastrophe of Nagasaki and Hiroshima on the one side on the one side also Auschwitz and the concentration camps on the other side so for the first time there was this moment for which we, humanity felt as one, but on the other side, we, has, we witnessed the, the, the contrary, which is that planet has never been in danger as it was since 1945, after the Second World War. Um, for me, in that article, uh, what was important was also to say that somehow this understanding, this vision of the Earth as an untouchable planet, an entity that cannot be manipulated, that has to be protected and that has been repaired, became somehow some kind of a last refuge for philosophical thought, a kind of limit for the unthinkable. So it became just something to be protected, something you cannot think of, something that cannot be manipulated, cannot be contaminated by thought anymore because somehow became the unthinkable itself, but just has to be exhibited in front of you as the last limit of thought. So in a sense that reproduced this kind of sacred space, uh, as I said before, the unthinkable, something which is out of the philosophical logos, something that cannot be mobilized by thought, and I was opposing to this uh, sacred, uh, unique earth, the proliferation of uh, what I call an anarchic earth of, uh, or other earths, um, more than one planet, uh, but I'll try maybe to, later to, to say what I mean by that, um, um, to be opposed to this kind of uh, sacred, sacred uh, space that cannot be touched, cannot be, uh, it's not thinkable anymore. Okay. I said that the, the bombing of Nagasaki Hiroshima uh, made emerge this new planet. There was another moment in which for one, uh, humanity felt as one, um, for once, sorry. Uh, 
uh, that moment was when uh, you, of course, everybody knows here uh, about this event, when suddenly the astronauts left the Earth and they took picture of the Earth from the outside so that we could see for the first time the whole Earth as one or at once. Um, and of course, um, that was what the astronaut defined. Uh, um, he said that I think that in that uh, occasion, now finally humanity is united, is one. Okay. This image of the Earth from the outside realize or fulfill or accomplish somehow a certain need, as I said before, for creating a separated humanity or at least that humanity has the power of having a separated gaze on the world to give sense to it as if humanity is outside from this world. This is somehow the project of what we have called it Aufklärung, enlightenment. Kant, the German philosopher Kant, um, also uh, defines this need for humanity to have this kind of alien gaze on the world, uh, what he calls somehow critique. Uh, so critique defines itself as this possibility of having an external gaze on the world to give sense to it. And if you can't have this kind of external gaze, you cannot see the world as a totality. So this totalization of the world into what we have called Earth, which means one totality, has been somehow paradoxically the accomplishment of this totalitarian project of building or constructing these external gates on the world. Um, um, German philosopher Martina Heidegger was very impressed by this image, by these uh, pictures taken from outside the earth. Uh, you might know that um, at the end of his life, um, a journalist, a German journalist went to Heidegger's hut not house, hut actually, and asked him, he showed him those pictures and he asked him, what do you think? Isn't this the biggest conquest of humanity? The fact that he was able to leave the earth and look at the earth from the outside. And actually for Heidegger, uh, the global view of the earth from the outside as an errant planet suggested at once complete interconnectedness. So let's say what we would define an ecological understanding of relation and coexistence, but at the same time also generated the extreme danger of totalitarian control. Because as I said before, imagining the earth as one totality is in a sense, the result of a technological vision that accompanied and fulfilled what has been defined metaphysics. And also it neutralizes any dynamics that may start another history. Um, I'll try to be a bit clear on that because I know these uh, things which uh, could sound a bit uh, um, uh, bizarre. Let's say that these external gates, this vision of the Earth as one totality, is the accomplishment of what has been called globalization. So let's say that finally, or as the final stage of this pro process, we have been calling the one modernity, or here we can say the European modernity, so a very special local, one of the modernities, one of the temporalities which traverse what we call 
uh, in a very reductive way, modernity, produced this global view of the earth, which paradoxically taken from the outside, from the alien um, vision, produces a planet which is a kind of a self-contained uh, uh, planetary interior. So, um, even in the, in the most recent understanding of, of the planet as a living, a unique living um, environment, you, you could think of what has been called Gaia by, for example, of course, James Lavelock, but more recently also Brunatour and others. Um, Gaia as well is seen or imagined as this one unique totality, unique condition for life, which are regulated by this kind of cybernetic homeostatic entity in which feedback and information are um, uh, constantly uh, redirecting the way in which this life continues to live. So in a sense, rejecting uh, the, the possibility that life is not unique, that this planet is not unique. And, one, and once again, that planetary may define another condition rather than this unique condition that we call life, you know, which actually seems to be uh, much informed, my, much built on uh, a certain cybernetic understanding of what we call an organism. But I won't go into that too much. It's just to say that we might say that the globe is an abstraction because as we said before, it needs an external gates in order to exist. But the planet could suggest, for example, as Gayatri Spivak argued some years ago, something very different from the globe because planetarity may suggest, uh, Speaker Spivak says, in the species of alterity, just the fact of belonging to another system. So we could define a system you are in, within, but at the same time, to what you don't belong, or at least belonging is not exactly the way you inhabit it. Um, from this perspective, let's say, uh, planetarity would uh, make, would reveal relation or infinite relation of not non-interchangeable -inter entities, and then planetarity would allow for the aesthetically immeasurable, not measurable. I will see what we mean by that. Offering planetarity, the figure for the collapse of the totality of globes and globality, as has been said by Jennifer Gabris a couple of years ago. So in this sense, the purpose of thinking in a planetary perspective is not that of abandoning Earth, exploring extraterrestrial planets or evacuating it to return it to its sidereal errancy, but rather to conceive its planetary dimension as an inexhaustible production of biodiversity. And as I see it, not only bio, because as I said before, somehow biology cannot exhaust what we call planetarity and cannot exhaust what we call here the planetary condition. Um, uh, here I would like to, to, um, to say something uh, about um, a, a different approach to what we have been calling the earth in, into philosophy. For example, French philosopher Gilles Deleuze, uh, because as I said before, the earth became uh, this kind of unthinkable limit, which just need to be exhibited in order to stop thinking and just uh, be ashamed of 
continue thinking. For example, for Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari, the term geophilosophy indicated something else. Uh, I will read some quotes, but these are just meant to give you some coordinates, of course. Uh, the, the prefix geo in geophilosophy, wrote Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari, indicates the constitutive relationship of philosophy with non-philosophy, the necessity for non-philosophy to become the earth and people of philosophy. So for Deleuze and Guattari, the, the prefix geo does not indicate any precedence or antecedents, but rather an immanent resistance to the exhaustion of philosophy. It reveals, this is um, what, for example, Adorno would say, that objects do not go into their concept without leaving a remainder. And that means that non-identity is a presence that always up, act upon us. So the, the geo of geophilosophy, it calls philosophy to a revolution that entails a mode of thinking capable of germinating its viewpoints along lines of complicity between antagonistic and incommensurable fronts. Uh, this uh, is taken by a short essay by Reza Negarestani on, on, uh, on geotrauma and geophilosophy. So these coordinates are, um, will introduce us to the last part of my short talk. Uh, it's really hard, I tell you, to stay in, in such a short time. Um, so what we could understand now that the Anthropocene, far from being, from, from being uh, just a punctual and global event, because this is how geology would picture it, it rather represents a kind of a pluri-historical, multi-differentiated series of processes, which are actually producing other cascades uh, of um, what TJ Demos has called the multi-directional waves of colonial, genocidal, extractive, nuclear, capitalistic modernities and collapses worlds. So, um, what is important for me to point out here is that uh, uh, art in this uh, scenario plays uh, a role which I won't define unique or special. The role of art into all this is just one of the possible, <laughs> um, as Negaristani said, germinating viewpoints. But I would say that art has been um, very receptive, at least of this kind of uh, uh, sensitivity for uh, planetary uh, diversities and the possibility of opening up um, different histories and uh, uh, also to escape uh, this uh, understanding of uh, with a feeling of exhaustion, uh, European modernity is feeling now. Uh, the feeling that everything is just uh, approaching this unique end. Of course, when you multiply the ends of the world, also the origins of the words multiply and proliferate. So, for example, uh, recently, um, our critique, philosopher, curator, Nicolas Boriot, which I think for those who have been attending these seminars has been already um, quoted by Natalie Loveless, I think in the first seminar, but she was uh, talking about relational aesthetics, an old book by Nicolas Boriot. Boriot um, engaged recently with the concept of Anthropocene in a book which hasn't been yet published in English, but uh, I think it will come out with MIT Press, which will be called Inclusions um, Art in the Age of Anthropocene, or at least that's, I think, the name in French uh, or the, in the original language of the book. Anyway, for Borio, uh, Anthropocene is the space of new promiscuity. It's a kind of a brutal bringing together of all uh, kingdoms and spheres 
in a space suddenly devoid of boundaries. Um, contemporary art in this, in this view host, uh, plays host to a productive entanglement between the human and the non-human. Um, uh, and he presents what Borio calls coactivity as such. Uh, the fact that indeed the universe is made out of multiple energies working side by side or together and the work of human, human beings is nourished by bacteria, other mammals, or the flow of nature. As Borio points out, um, in many artworks, organic growth proceeds with the operation of software and human relations are entangled with marketing channels or algorithms. Um, all these relations amongst different regime are, in, are uh, of a living and non-living are intention. Uh, what is important to point out that for Bourreau, this uh, today art no longer occupies a dominant symbolic position, what I was saying before. It doesn't enjoy a special status. It's just an activity nourished by multiple parallel activities, an object within a world of objects. So um, this idea uh, presents the fact that somehow artistic practice nowadays is based on encounters rather than uh, form. Why I say that? Um, somehow we have this idea of form uh, which is based on a very old idea defined by Plato, uh, which give to this activity of giving form, uh, use a verb, uh, which is platane. But he also use another verb to, to describe this activity of starting something, giving form to something, something which is arcane, as also an Arendt pointed out in Vitactiva. Um, in a sense, these two operations of giving form and commanding, starting something, giving a command in order to, to start something new, became intertwined in our understanding. So in a sense, form became somehow an activity of production, which then with Christianity became an creatio ex nihilo, a creation out of nothing. Giving form became the capacity of giving form or inanimate a brute matter. If we don't understand that somehow matter always gives forms to itself, that the forms is informing something which is already uh, in form or is already mattering as for example, Karen Barad would say, we'll never escape this dualism. On one hand, uh, the spiritual force, the spiritual energy as penetration. On the other hand, um, matter as something which is waiting uh, to be animated. So is artificially inanimate by this, uh, by the, uh, waiting of, of this spiritual force. Anyway, um, I'm going to my conclusion, I know it's very late. Um, um, there were many, of course, artistic examples I could use and Rachel was ready uh, to show you uh, many of them I could quote, uh, but here when I say some example, I don't mean that they are exemplary. Once again, that they have a special status uh, that showing them means that they are especially expressing something, but they are part of a proliferating uh, um, awareness or, or thinkability of certain processes. Um, of course, we might uh, recall here, uh, you know, for example, the Ecotopian library uh, by <clears throat> the, the, uh, the Ecotopian library by Mary Mattingly or uh, Thomas Saraceno, Ar Arocene, uh, 
the Umwelt by Per Hugh, to just quote Olaf Furelison, I'm quoting just the most known artists on the scene, so it's not even interesting uh, to quote them. I'm just saying that they are dealing, there are so many young artists uh, from New Zealand, Japan, Korea, uh, Senegal, they are um, just, just because, of course, climate change is not um, a white invention of uh, our white world is too polluted. It is something which affect, of course, atmospheres disseminated all over the world. Actually, climate change is the very revelation, revel, uh, revelation that this political subject, which always deletes its own um, traces, uh, is toxically disseminated all over the planet. And especially what is toxic nowadays is not something that you can sense. It has some kind of built-in invisibility. Uh, so actually toxicity is the most unsensitive and unsensible, uh, unseen thing of the world. So uh, there is no time for me, maybe for the, with the students at SVA, we can go deeper into that, but just I wanna say, there is a built-in invisibility in, um, in this dimension of climate change, but at the same time, artists are trying to uh, open up this new sensorium um, to somehow uh, not train the senses, not form new senses, but somehow um, awake uh, some kind of what Marx would have called a general intellect, but he, in this case, we could call a general ecological aesthetics, the capacity of sensing something uh, which is uh, insensitive, insensible, which always has all the interest to remain unseen. Anyway, <clears throat> um, uh, I, I approach my end. Um, so uh, somehow we have seen how Earth uh, is uh, mm, defined uh, in modernity by this um, kind of uh, possibility of being censored as, as one totality. Practically, the Earth nowadays is also uh, covered by sensors, as you know, everywhere. And these sensors kind of uh, give back a polyphony of uh, images um, which are intertwined with artificial intelligence, data banks, um, non-living entities, living entities, uh, inanimated object, plants, animals, human ecosystems, and also, of course, the planet uh, magnetic fields, radiation belt, and uh, atmospheric carbon levels. Somehow, Felix Guattari, uh, in his book on molecular revolution, uh, already approached globalization, which he then called uh, integrated world capitalism, from this chemical angle, calling for a molecular revolution. In other words, I quote from Guattari, a molecular sabotage of a dominant social subjectivity, end of a quote, in which the multiplication of interstitial struggles would replace the traditional political parties. For Guattari saw the arrival of a kind of bacteriological social war, something that no longer asserts itself according to clearly de delimited fronts, but in the form of molecular up, up evils, uh, revolutions that are difficult to apprehend or to sense. So, according to Guattari, I quote, all sorts of viruses of this kind are already attacking the social body in its relations of consumption, work, leisure, and culture. Mutations with uh, unpredictable consequences will continue to emerge in the subjectivity, conscious and unconscious, of individuals and social groups. End of a quote. So, um, Somehow, this metaphysical dimension, which has been recorded in my talk, always 
tried to find a foundation into this kind of solidity, into this kind of materiality understood as something that somehow uh, could be subtra uh, subtracted to manipulation. As we said, uh, the end of metaphysics actually invented his last refuge, with, which is the untouchable earth. An earth, which I said, is totally exploited by capital, uh, global capitalism, but uh, became kind of the, the last um, limit of metaphysical thought, the last invention of this kind of sacred uh, foundation, the point which cannot be modified, mod the point that for metaphysics is unchangeable, is not subject to change. Metaphysics always had this problem of understanding change as the fundamental foundation of thought itself. So I go to my conclusion. So in a sense, as I said, when I mean metaphysics, I, I mean by that Western metaphysics demonstrates the metaphorical primacy of solidity over the dynamics and turbulence of water and the air in our metaphors for understanding the world. An ontological primacy of solidity in which, as Henri Bersan recalls, I quote, our thought is built in the image of solids. And reality and rationality are defined by sharp, separate contours, material supports, um, and take distance from the turbulent flow as something insignificant. Uh, so it take distance from the evanescent fragility of the bonds of a world in which, as Bergson say, only change is permanent. Uh, the dynamics of these formulas, uh, the, sorry, the dynamics of, the, of, for, of this formless dimension on which actually we depend is the most hidden aspect of our culture. Uh, and this is also very well highlighted by multiple non-European uh, cultural histories. So this is why for me, uh, the frames and the narrative of climate change nowadays directly invoke, especially in the media and the, and the visual arts, the dimension of an extreme change an irreversible catastrophe that are all emotional characters that petrify us rather than enable any form of sharing. Uh, and I think this is the product of, uh, or it goes alongside with us, uh, this uh, kind of Promethean, uh, pro from the myth of Prometheus, narratives of dystopian future, which are uh, just reproducing the old idea of technological management of the world and future as a continuous growth. Um, and I go to really my conclusion. For me, instead, climate change in its, for example, relation to art, I know, I know now I'm running very fast, so hopefully you will be able to follow what I'm saying. Um, Climate change also actually shouldn't be uh, just uh, awakening us to this collapsing imaginary, to this single catastrophic end of this uh, uh, endless growth, as we call it, our future. But rather, we have to recognize that um, thinking has always been atmospherical. And by this, we mean that somehow uh, thought always need to mix up with all other elements. Uh, that thought always uh, requires the embracement of foreign materials because thought is not the property or um, of the resource or the resource of a substance, but is rather enhanced by further alienation. Um, the actualization of thought, this is why I say that actually all these things are totally thinkable, 
I don't upset the unthinkability of this uh, climate change, uh, planetary condition. For me, those are not limits, but rather they enhance, they, they are um, energizing moments. Uh, thought is never, is never exhausted by its own actualization. It, its actualization does not exhaust its potential, but the actualization of thought actually increase, increases thought. Uh, and I think I will end here. I don't see anybody, Simonetta, Rachel, uh, because I think I'm already out of time, running out of time. Um, Rani, I'm here. Yeah, I've been sorry. here all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know, it's, yeah, sorry. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, but don't worry about the time, you know. It's, it's okay. Your, your um, I think, I think I, I can end here because my point was exactly to, I, 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 should, I, I wasn't able, but to just uh, introduce this uh, uh, personal take off on the necessity of escaping uh, foundation or refoundation of thought on the basis of some solid grounds. And they call for this more atmospherical understanding of climate change, which actually revolution philosophy. Um, anyway, I, I hope it was clear what I tried to say and I hope now we can have a discussion with all the people here. Thank you. Uh, I just uh, I got a message from George Smith who uh, has to sign ah, yeah. off, but sends his greetings and thanks. Okay, I thank him. Um, okay, so yes, we are running a little late, but uh, I would like to have at least 10 minutes for questions from the audience. And I just want to remind um, students of IDSBA that there would be a separate session with Giovanni um, later on this afternoon. So I hope you will come to that one. Uh, but Giovanni, thank you so much for this uh, really um, stimulating and uh, thought provoking talk, which uh, I'm sure will generate more, more thinking. Uh, there's a, one question here that I will read to you um, uh, by Eddie um, asking, do you think that basically we should be positive in our potential to change the future? I answer to question by way one or you collect them, what do you prefer? This is the one I got uh, okay. for now. Okay. Uh, I mean, the, the, as I, I was saying, the, the fact that, uh, what, what's the name, sorry, of the person who put the question? Eddie. Eddie, Eddie, uh, the question you are, uh, you are um, asking here or, or the remarks you're doing here is, uh, uh, exactly one of the point of, of my talk, uh, uh, which of course was very short. And of course, all the people here, besides the IDC students, they might contact me at the later stage if they want, because I tell you it's really hard in 40 minutes or one hour to, to speak of those things. So it was really, I was really running. But what are you asking if we have to, if we, if we can't be positive about the future? The future does not exist. As I was saying, as the earth never existed, there was never one earth, as there was never one future. In a sense, the past is yet to come, you know, because as I was saying, we all tell an autobiography of modernity in which everything that happened, it seems uh, just the, the unfolding or of, of um, the single history. So this I call it an autobiography. In this autobiography, future is the end of the world. Because uh, as you know, the unsustainability of our, what we call civilization, only uh, could uh, bring to, to its own end. But we are very lucky because uh, thanks God, we are not alone. So it was never true that the future existed as there are many things to come. Uh, there are many futures if you want to keep this, this word. Um, if we see, as I said, the future as, for example, this kind of growth, or if we still uh, see, for example, Prometheus as the founding hero or what we call technology, you, you might remember Prometheus was this, um, 
Titan who was able to control the fire and control him, by controlling the fire, he gave power to humanity. He's, he has stolen the fire from the gods to give it to humanity. You know, if you see that, that controlling the fire, uh, managing something unmanageable is the model for, for future, then of course uh, we are approaching a, uh, a, a defeat which cannot be avoided. On the other side, for example, if you think of, of a Greek philosopher Empedocles who throw himself in the volcano, uh, that's another approach, for example, to nature, which I don't mean by that the suicide. I mean by that another understanding of um, a relation to the elements and how, for example, you are part of something. If we, we, ne we have never been part of any other history, in a sense, the only way for our history to, to happen was to separate ourselves and to build an autobiography. Uh, French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss said in, at the end of his uh, Anthropologie Structurelle 2, uh, second uh, structural anthropology, that Western civilization, in order to, to exist, needed, like a virus, other civilization to, to exist, because like a virus insert uh, a string of genetic code into an organism in order to make this organism obey to its own formula. Um, Western civilization always needed other civilization in order to reproduce its own life. So he always, uh, Levi Strauss spoke of this kind of viral condition of Western civilization, but this virality has always been uh, hidden in the sense that, as I said, uh, at some point of my on my talk, I always, I already forgot what I said, but uh, some, somewhere I should have said that uh, this kind of canceling the traces of what has been done, this kind of disinvestment of politics from any subjectivity to make that everything is just a self-correcting act of management as a kind of an organism which has just to, uh, uh, answer to certain feedback and uh, take control again of certain uh, misconduct. All this is always a perpetual hiding of a, found, of a viral foundation of, of this civilization. So, uh, I don't know if positive is a good word. I don't like the word hope, uh, but I say there is more, uh, there is more. I mean, oh, thanks God, it's not uh, just us, so. Uh, even if we end, it's not the, we end all, all the words. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, another question is um, by Andreas, um, uh, who asks, Gaia in the sense of Latour is, as I understand it, not about the Earth as totality viewed from the outside. That's rather what he denounces as viewed from Sirius. For Latour, Gaia is about agency. The Earth system is a political actor. Could you comment on that? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I probably, thank you, Andreas. Um, I probably mix it, the two things the Earth from the outside and the Gaia argument. They are not the, sa um, the same thing. I, what I was referring to when I say Gaia, I just mean that um, on one side, you have Gaia as this kind of cybernetical entity, which is, I, I, as I understood it, but I think Yukui recently spoke on that, on an article on ecology and machines, where he recalls um, the fact that somehow Norbert Wiener's cybernetic hypothesis also informed uh, this kind of homeostatic organism we call Gaia. But my point was rather, I have a problem with the uniqueness of Gaia. You were saying Latour, uh, not only Latour, but also Isabel Stengers always says that Gaia is not just simply a planet, but the uniqueness of an event of life uh, that cannot be reproduced or could continue in a certain condition which are unique. So is a kind of, once again, is a kind of limit to what you can think or you can do. Somehow when you say Gaia, I should stop and I should uh, put myself on the knees in the front of a new God. That's how I personally uh, understand. I know uh, that's very uh, personal. I'm not uh, 
uh, defending here. But I'm just saying, you are right in your, uh, I, I didn't mean uh, that Gaia is this kind of a, a planet you see from the outside, but it's rather for me, this kind of unique condition uh, and this uniqueness, um, it's, it's a problem for me. I, I'm sorry, we, won't, we don't have a proper debate. So I am trying to, uh, so I don't know what you think. You cannot re reply to me, but I hope uh, I was uh, answering your question more or less or, or introducing a new question maybe. Thank you, Giovanni. Uh, do we have time for one more? I think so, right? Um, so there's a question here that uh, asked if uh, by Taco, um, if relations and encounters are replacing artworks as things and images, should we do away of nature as an image? Atmospherical understanding complicates the notion of image, I presume. Yeah, but I think the, the, the notion of image was complicated enough already at the end of the 20th century. You might be familiar with the Jacques Rancière book uh, on the future of images, where actually was speaking about the, what cannot be presented, no? for example, Auschwitz, so that somehow is presented with its being obscene, out of the scene somehow. Um, what's the problem with image? Um, Plate, I'm sorry if I say those things which are very classical and I'm sure you already know, but um, it, we have all the, but this connects to our first question uh, on the future. Uh, we always have this understanding of image as something I produce or I put in front of me. For example, image of thought as something that, for example, I am all, I, I'm able to, to, to produce and then I can imagine because I am able to produce an image. Um, in his, uh, in his uh, thesis on the atomic age, uh, philosoph the German philosopher, or Jewish, as you like, first husband, Hohan Arendt, Gunther Anders, was saying that we are inverted utopians. By, me, by this, he means that we do things we cannot imagine. So our usual understanding, we imagine something, we are able to produce a kind of a mental image. You know, the idea of Plato, uh, all, all these uh, semantics, I'm not gonna recall here because it's so very long, but let's say that we now live in a condition in which we are always in, in the middle of things and we do things on which we cannot imagine consequences. We cannot produce an image of that. So art, I think, and I think that's the point of Nicolas Bourriot, uh, now, I don't say privileges, but experience so strongly these encounters before even you can produce an image of that. Uh, uh, I think he's describing a condition, not, he's not saying that art should be this or that, or it's just, uh, you know, as a curator, as a person who observes, uh, is also living in the middle of those things, it just has a kind of uh, seismographer or, or, you know, a kind of, is collecting this feeling, you know. It's the same I was saying before. Now, for example, we have this feeling that what all the thoughts that are expressed nowadays, they are not yet, yet organized in some kind of sense. Uh, they are more kind of proliferating, germinating, I said before something close to what uh, Karl Marx called it the general intellect. Uh, in honestly, for me, for example, if I would give this talk in ten minutes, I would do it differently because it's not. It's, for me, it's not really important to kind of um, fully express something because I'm here trying to present some somehow some some germinating thoughts, uh, which are, I think, popping up everywhere. And uh, we are now kind of instrument just for, for that, for bringing those together without collecting them into a totality. Uh, so I know that I was quoting, but that doesn't even mean that, you know, great thinker have to legitimize what to say or what I say, you know. Um, it's not the way 
thought is produced or thinking is produced now, I think, or art. I don't make this big difference, uh, usually. Thank you, Giovanni. Uh, I know this could go on for a long time, but I think we um, we need to we need to end it here. Um, and um, I want to thank everybody who joined us today. And please uh, stay stay informed because we are going to have another session, uh, another series of lectures in the fall on the Anthropocene. Uh, so starting again in September. And to IDSVA students, I say, I'll see you soon. We have a session after this. So please uh, come and bring your questions with you. And Giovanni, thank you so much again. Oh, thank, thank you, Simonetta. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, George, who's not there anymore. And thank all, all the people. I know it's a Saturday for me evening for you afternoon. So I mean, to listen to these things is quite an effort. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Giovanni. And thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend.